Welcome to sermons from St. Paul's Lutheran Church of Minot, North Dakota. St. Paul's is anchored in the message of Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins, for the church and for the world. The following sermon is from Rev. Dr. Matthew Richard. The Old Testament reading for the seventh Sunday of Easter is from Ezekiel chapter 36. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord declares the Lord God, when through you I will vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all of your uncleanliness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to obey my just decrees. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of Jesus. Amen. As we know from the Old Testament, The Israelites often behaved badly. Yes, they behaved badly many, many times. Even though they were set apart to be God's very own possession, his holy people, a unique people in that time and place, well, they would often get tied up in worshiping pagan gods over and over and over. Needless to say, the Lord God would then use neighboring, yes, neighboring nations to discipline Israel. In the case of our Old Testament reading from this morning, It was the nation of Babylon that disciplined Israel, that is, more specifically, the nation of Judah, which was just the south of Israel itself. Now, during the severe discipline, the Lord God would often speak, though, wonderful gospel promises into the midst of those people as they were being disciplined. And so, as a side note, do not let anyone try to convince you that the Old Testament is just full of law and not gospel. That is not the case. And so today's Old Testament reading is one such example of a profound gospel message spoken to the people of Israel and Judah. Listen to it again. Listen to it paraphrased. Listen to what the Lord God promises to those Israelites. Here's what God says. For here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you out of these countries, gather you from all over, and bring you back to your own land. I'll pour water, pure water over you and scrub you clean. I'll give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you. I'll remove the stone heart from your body and replace it with a heart that's God-willed, not self-willed. I'll put my spirit in you and make it possible for you to do what I tell you and live by my commands. You'll once again live in the land I gave your ancestors. You'll be my people and I will be your God. Now, One thing that is important is this. Who's going to do all of this? Who's going to accomplish all of this? Who's going to make this happen? The nations of Israel and Judah? Were they going to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and make this happen? No, it is the Lord God who promises to do this, who will do this for them. In fact, as you look through this whole section of the book of Ezekiel, the whole book of Ezekiel, this section more specifically this chapter, this area of the text. God uses the first person, I. Yes, I. I will do this. He uses it some 34 times to talk about how he will do this, how he's going to cleanse them, how he's going to deliver them, how he's going to cause them to walk in his commands, and so forth. And so make no mistake about it. Our Lord God is active. He's mighty. He's powerful to cleanse sins, to give new hearts, to transform minds. In fact, when one reads the verses of Ezekiel chapter 36, it is quite difficult not to see this as a prophecy speaking of the New Testament doctrine 
and practice of baptism itself. Now hear me out for a moment. In holy baptism, you are not taken out of Babylon, but you're taken out of the kingdom of darkness. At this holy font, with the mighty waters of baptism, indeed you are sprinkled clean, to, give a clean, to be given a clean conscience. You're given a new heart, you're given the Holy Spirit, so that you will not be alone, but that you will have God, and that God will have you. In baptism, you became God's own possession as he marked you with the sign of the cross. And like the reading from the book of Ezekiel, baptism is not your work, but is the work of God. It is a mighty work of God to you and upon you. Now, there's a problem, though. Yes, there's always a problem. You see, every generation tries to dim the gospel's brightness because it actually seems too good to be true. Furthermore, one of the fundamental problems within North American Christianity is this, is that we have this peculiar notion in American Christianity that we are somehow masters and commanders of our own spiritual destiny. We hold to the idea that we have a free will, that we can do what we want whenever we want, and we will do it our way. And so when the gospel is presented as too bright and too good to be true, when the gospel is presented as one-sided, a work of God for us, well, we protest. When we hear that the Lord God does all the heavy lifting and leaves nothing for us, well, we get agitated. Because that kind of gospel well, leaves no room for us to get our foot in the door. It leaves no room for us to participate in our salvation or contribute our best efforts before God himself. Now, perhaps we function this way. Perhaps we function this way in America because we have never been ruled by a foreign dictator since 1787. In other words, it is easy for us to believe that we can do whatever we want, when we want, and however we want it because we've never truly felt what it is like to be trapped underneath a person's thumb. We've never been deported to a foreign pagan country to live under that country's rules, to live under that country's language, their customs, and their power. In other words, America's spirituality can be quite cocky, quite arrogant, if you will. We tend to show off our so-called free will, as if we have done something mighty before God Almighty. But dear friends, the fact of the matter is this. Even though we live with a tremendous amount of freedom in America, at least for the time being, Spiritually speaking, we're no different. We're no different than those Israelites, those people from Judah, from our reading in the book of Ezekiel. We're no different than them who lived under a foreign ruler. For example, apart from the Lord God's intervention in our lives, we must confess this morning that apart from God's intervention in our lives, we are spiritually blind, stumbling in sin within the kingdom of darkness. Apart from the Lord God, our hearts are like stone. Actually, we could say it's actually much worse than stone. We're actually an act of rebellion against God himself. We're an act of rebellion against his divine commands. And so, dear friends, hear this loud and clear. Hear this loud and clear. Apart from the Lord God, we cannot and we will not believe in God, obey God, or abide in the Lord God himself, which is the reason why the Lord God has to first act upon you and me. And so the point is this for us this morning. We Christians should be able to say with a bold confidence this day, in light of everything that we know from the scriptures, in light of what God has done for us, in light of how God has acted in history and how he has accomplished salvation in the person of Christ, in light of all of that, we should with bold confidence be able to say this, if it were not for the Lord God Almighty intervening in my life, I would be nothing but a poor, miserable, damned sinner in the foreign kingdom of darkness, destined to hell, a hell that I deserve. God have mercy. And yet we should be able to go on and say this, but the Lord God, he snatched me, snatched me from the kingdom of darkness. He washed me. He forgave me of my sins. He gave me his spirit and he made me his own. He had every reason not to do this, yet he did this for me, the chief of sinners, and for that, I'm forever grateful. I do not deserve this, and I certainly cannot take credit for it. 
I was dead, but now I'm alive. I was blind, but now I see. I was deaf, but now I hear. Oh, this is gracious. God did this to me and for me. But it does not stop there. Since the Lord God himself not only cleansed you, gave you his Holy Spirit, and delivered his holy impulses to you, but also caused you to walk in his word, all the good that you are permitted to give, all the good that you're permitted to receive, does not belong to your reason, does not belong to your strength, does not belong to anything except the Lord's grace and goodness to you. Dear friends, never forget that the Lord God has made you holy. He's made you holy through his word and his sacraments. And then he prepares good works for you to walk in. And do you never forget, you abide in him as his work of art. And so everything good in your life, the good that you are able to give, the good that you're able to receive, the food that you eat, the shelter you rest under, the clothes that you wear, the protection that you have are all, yeah, they're all a sheer gift to you because of the Father's divine goodness to you. Baptized saints, while there's much that we may have earned in this life, our educational degrees, our salary, our homes, our reputations, our wisdom, our pensions, and so forth, all of this is only possible because the Lord God has been gracious to you and gracious to me. All of this is a sheer gift. It is all a sheer gift that we have been given. For if the Lord God were to withdraw his gracious hand for even a moment, all of us would perish. All would fall away. Everything would be lost. Indeed, the reading from the Old Testament book of Ezekiel is profound good news. It is such good news for us to hear. The Lord God, he cleanses his people. He removes the heart of stone and gives a heart of flesh. He delivers his spirit. He rescues and claims as his own, his very own people. And it is no different for you and me today. Everything that you have been given is a sheer gift, not a reward for your faithfulness, not a prize for your generous disposition, and not a medal for your heroic prayer life. Instead, the Lord God, he has restored you to a right relationship with him through baptizing you into the life and the death and the resurrection of his beloved son, Jesus Christ, because of his rich mercy, because of his abundant grace that is for you. This is the good news of the gospel that Ezekiel proclaims to you and to me this day. Blessed saints, yes, blessed saints, you are deeply loved by God the Father through Jesus Christ and have done nothing to earn it or deserve it. It is a sheer and tremendous and wonderful gift for you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thy strong word bespeaks us righteous, bright with thine own holiness. Thank you for listening to today's podcast sermon. You can access a full manuscript of today's sermon from Pastor Matthew Richard's blog at www.pastormatrichard.org or visit St. Paul's website at www.stpaulsminot.org. The Lord bless and keep you. 